Welcome to the show. Today's guest, Jim Hersher, is recognized as one of the pioneers of modern pharmaceutical compounding. Jim is responsible for the formulation of many bioidentical hormone, dermatological, nutritional, and anti-aging compounds in wide use throughout the U.S. He has worked in radio and TV, including multiple appearances on Dr. Phil as a hormone expert. As a member of the board of the Alliance of Pharmacy Compounding, Jim is passionate about the benefits pharmaceutical compounding can bring to patients. In this episode, we'll be talking about hormone replacement therapy, bioidentical hormones, and how they can help conditions like PCOS, endometriosis, and so much more. So if you have hormones at some point in your life, they might get a little wonky, and this episode is for you. Hello. Thank you so much for being with us here today. It's an honor to be here with you, and and thank you for asking. So tell us a little bit about you, your credentials, and why you specifically went into pharmaceutical compounding. I've been a pharmacist since uh, 79. I'm not a young guy. (laughs) And then we started, opened this pharmacy in 84, and I wanted to do it based on customer service. And then we started doing compounding, some dermatological. I got kind of good at dermatological compounding for doctors. And then we had an event and the event was, is that my wife had a hysterectomy, oophorectomy. So at 28 years old, I had a menopausal woman on my hands. And so, and she's, you know, this, this wonderful human being with, I mean, beautiful, talented photographic memory, you know, I mean, she was just a dynamo. Uh, managing a department store in addition to helping me start the pharmacy. So she had a lot of irons in the fire and could do them all. And then after the hysterectomy, oophorectomy, um, she's menopausal. I saw her degrade just so rapidly. And it just, it broke my heart because I thought, you know, I had this perfect woman and, and I love her to death. I got to try to fix her because I'm a fixer. I'm a caretaker. And so the doctors, what they tried did not work. Oh, we're just going to give her some Premarin and she'll be fine. Well, she wasn't fine. She was worse. And so I came up with the idea to use the first, and I invented the first transdermal estradiol gel, which is a natural bioidentical hormone. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to get my girl back, you know. And so from then on, we've had an an incredible advancement in our knowledge of of hormone balance and all that. And, And we've been right on the cusp of all of it because we were there at the very beginning. That led me to to think more broadly, Kat. You know. When you have things in your personal life that don't work out with traditional medicine, and most of my friends are traditional medicine doctors, I'm not bad mouthing them. It's just that sometimes what they have, what they're selling doesn't work. And so then I, uh, I started looking more broadly. And so I started getting training from naturopathic physicians and, and people in natural medicine trying to figure out what is going on. What, how can I fix things that traditional medicine says, well, you can't do anything for that. And that led me to, to classes and all over the country. And eventually I started teaching integrative medicine, which is what we call it now. Back then it was just natural medicine in the 80s and 90s. And so that's what I, I now teach to doctors um, who are traditional medicine doctors and say, I'd, I'd like to learn more about that. And so it's need to be evidence-based. And so because I'm in a precarious position as a pharmacist, I need to be evidence-based so that the doctors don't go, oh, that's just fluff. You know, they need some science behind it. And so not only do I teach them protocols on how to practice, but I also teach them some of the science behind there, some of the studies that show what this really is, has an effect that has been studied in science and can, has a positive outcome for patients. Because that's really the measure of all of our therapies is, are there positive patient outcomes? So that, that led me from, you know, 1984 to now. (laughs) So let's just get right into bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. Let's start off with why is Big Pharma lobbying against bioidentical hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, I don't know if you remember the Women's Health Initiative study of 2002, which said that, oh, women, if you uh, are using hormones, if you're using estrogen and progesterone, they didn't specify which one. They said uh, you will have an increased risk of breast cancer, heart disease, stroke, um, osteoporosis, dementia. I mean, they, they named all these things. And actually, Big Pharma was took it, took it on the chin because at the time, Premarin, pregnant mare's urine, which is truly, it truly is that they catch the urine of pregnant horses and dry it and put it in a pill. <laughs> 
That was the number one drug in the world, in the world, two billion dollars. And, and this is in 2002. And so all of a sudden their sales dropped, plummeted to way down. I mean, and, and I was just thinking like 600 million over uh, a year. And so they go, oh my gosh, we're losing sales because of this study. And so women in America, 80% of them got off their hormones, just dropped them. And women were making the choice that I'm too scared to use hormones, so I'm going to use nothing. And Big Pharma didn't like that. And then the women that were making a choice, because at the time, I should back up, at the time, over 50% of women who were um, menopausal were using hormones. Over 50%. And so all of a sudden, we've got 80% of those women just dropping off. And Big Pharma goes, wait we're losing all these sales. And then the women started choosing natural alternatives, which is bioidentical hormones, biologically identical. And us compounders were filling that need, filling that niche. We also understood the concept of hormone balance, not just giving estrogen. It's about a balance of all the hormones for a woman to be optimal. And so women were doing better. And we now have from that point to now, we have 8 million women and men on bioidentical hormones, compounded bioidentical hormones. Now, that's a lot of folks. Matter of fact, that represents more than half of all patients that are using hormones in the U.S. So, obviously, we're a target for big pharma. I have so many questions. First off, there was a woman a while back, T.S. Wiley, and she was on a podcast that I listened to saying that women should have their periods using hormone replacement therapy as long as possible because once menstruation stops, aging advances quickly. So what are your thoughts on women artificially continuing menstruation and avoiding menopause? Is there any correlation with increased health, youthfulness, longevity, or do you think that's not the right route? There are several different pro uh, protocols for replacing hormones for women, if we're going to talk about women right now. And those protocols vary. There's one protocol that uses saliva testing and they use microdoses. I mean, we're talking of, of a biestrogen, you know, two estrogens. They use like 0.625 milligrams as their top dose. Whereas there's a middle of the road group that, that I have been teaching and my doctors uh, enjoy, they understand it, they can, they relate to it. And I use like a bias five milligrams as my starting dose for menopausal woman, which gives um, about the same amount of estrogen as a patch. Okay. And so they understand that and they go, but, but they get bioidentical hormones, both estriol and estradiol. So that's great. Well, then you have some other protocols. You have the pellet protocols where they're implanting these pellets under the skin. And, uh, and those doctors are typically being taught to use super physiologic doses, which means in lay terms that they're using doses that way exceed what is normally seen in the human body. Like, for instance, uh, you know, you're just a kid. OK, <laughs> I know you look 12. I don't know how young you are, Kat, but you look 12, you know, which is great. Um, so uh, they would they would look at you and they'd go, you know what, if I tested your uh, testosterone and I said, OK, I'm getting a. I'm getting a, a a level of about 50, which is really strong. They'd say, you know what? We need to have you at 250. And uh, and I've got women come in here regularly with pellet therapy that have 450, which is a man. That's a man. That's not a woman. And uh, and they're saying that's what you need to be. And that's when you use super physiology doses, you risk a lot of side effects. And those women are coming in with hair falling out, with acne. You know, they're angry. You know, they're they're gaining weight. They're not feeling good. So, again, we're trying to figure out how to use balanced hormones. And, uh, and the pellets, in my opinion, fall a little short on that. Women feel great at first on the pellets, by the way. They feel phenomenal. But then that, that uh, steroid euphoria from the hormones wears off. And unfortunately, they start feeling bad. So it's not a sustainable therapy, in my opinion. And then finally, we got the Wiley Protocol. Well, when I was testifying at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, in Washington, D.C., when the FDA was doing a study on hormones, they targeted pellet therapy and the Wiley protocol as being therapies they felt were dangerous. Okay, now this is the FDA talking, not me talking. It's the F FDA said, we feel like those two are dangerous, so we're going to try to put a stop to compounding of, of hormones, compounding by no hormones. The Wiley protocol, and this is her opinion, she and everybody, opinions are like rear ends. Everybody's got one. <laughs>
I'm, I'm sorry, from West Texas, we say weird stuff like that. So in her opinion is that women should have periods. I don't care if you're 60, 70, 75, you should still be having a period. Well, there is no science. And believe me, I read every study that comes out because I want to make sure that I'm doing the best job for my patients. And I have not seen any studies and any experts other than her that says that you have to have a period to stay healthy. Okay. Now what you do have to have, and this is very important. And by the way, um, before I go to the next point, Kat, I'd like to say that she uses doses that vary throughout the month, similar to a woman's uh, hormones as they vary throughout the month as well. But those doses are really high. I mean, oftentimes higher than premenopausal women. Okay. I have a little, I'm getting a little nervous about that. And, uh, and so those women tend to not do well long term. And plus they get tired of having that monthly visitor. <laughs> and, and so what we do in my protocol and the protocol that is the most widespread in the country in biodegradable hormones is we try to maintain a thickness of the uterus um, that is safe. If it's too thin, then women are, are having uh, discomfort and they're having bleeding. If it's too thick, then they're having bleeding. They're having risk of uterine cancer. Uh, they call it endometrial uh, cancer of the uterus. And, uh, and so what we try to do is use a balance of estrogens, you know, estradiol, estriol, progesterone, and testosterone in order to keep the lining of the uterus in a safe level, okay? And they can measure with a, a transvaginal ultrasound. So I urge all my women to once a year go in and get this transvaginal ultrasound, and it's a really easy procedure, and they measure the thickness of the uterus, uterine lining, and they find out that, okay, this is in a safe area. And, and it's not a big deal. Any gynecologist can do this, this uh, ultrasound. And, uh, and it is a, it's a nice tool for us to know that, yes, we're, we're doing a good job with balancing those cells inside the uterus, okay, because we do have to keep those healthy. Does that help answer the question that, that, uh, that there are all these protocols and, and the Wiley protocol is just one of them. And again, it's one that was targeted by FDA as being possibly dangerous. So because they do use levels that are so high. I mean, much higher than what we see in, in a typical woman. When I was younger, I remember Susan Summer came out with her book uh, that she talks about hormone replacement therapy, and there was a ton of scrutiny, and all the doctors were attacked in the book. Do you think they had any reason? Was there anything in the book that they were talking about hormone replacement therapy that you think that maybe they were wrong, or do you think they were overreacting? I mean, the doctors who were criticizing her in that book? And, and again, most of my friends are traditional doctors, okay? Because I live in the world between patients and doctors. You know, that, that's what a pharmacist does. And as an integrative medicine or natural pharmacist, I have to toe a line. You know, I, I have to be believable to my traditional docs. And so again, that, that means me being evidence-based. And for and all of a sudden, they start seeing my patients doing better than their patients. And they're seeing my patients happier and healthier and better sex lives and looking younger. And they go, you know, go see Jim and whatever that stuff is he's doing. Just just see him and, and, tell, and tell me what to do. Yeah. So I get a lot of referrals from traditional guys, but they have to see. It, it's almost like, you know, doubting Thomas having to stick hand in the wound. They have to see my patients doing better before they come over to the dark side of natural medicine, you know, and, and say, you know what, there may be something to that because my patients are healthier and they're happier and they're having, they're successful in, in that they feel better and their brains are clearer. And, and so they, these doctors have to see that firsthand and get that feedback from patients before they start saying, maybe there's something to that, you know? So they are traditionally skeptics. They're taught in medical school to be skeptics, to say, you know what? I can't just take every single opinion and make that part of my belief system. Now, here's, here's a funny thing, and doctors consider themselves scientists, but um, my best friend is the head of the largest physicians group in Texas, okay? So he's a big deal internal medicine doctor. You know, he is uh, um, brilliant, but traditional medicine. And, uh, and he said, Jim, 80% of the doctors in my practice, you know, 400 doctors do not know how to tell the difference in a study from, from relative risk versus absolute risk. 
you know, relative risk says, oh, you've got a 26% increased risk of breast cancer. Signif uh, biostatistics say that 26% increased risk is actually zero because that means 0.5 patients in a thousand. And that, that 0.5 patients in a thousand that gets breast cancer could be eating Big Macs. In other words, there's no correlation between the hormones and breast cancer. So most doctors, they're really good guys and they're good doctors and they are working within their belief system, but they tend to diss any opinion that is not coincidental with theirs. Isn't that true of all of us though? We're all human beings, right? We all put on our panties the same way in the morning. I don't put on panties. <laughs> By the way, you can tell I've been married 43 years, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so Human nature just says, I'm not going to acknowledge a belief system that's different than my own unless I see firsthand that there's something to it. So when I teach classes, again, I'm trying to teach classes of these traditional guys and, and say, okay, here's how you do this. Here's why we do this. And here's the studies that support it. So yes, it's natural for them to diss it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know how it is. My husband does functional medicine. He's an acupuncturist. So he has had so many interactions with doctors. The patients will come and see him and get better. And then they would tell their doctors and the doctors would be like, that's impossible. That's just hooey. That's not a real thing. And then they would come see him, get their stuff treated. And they're like, okay, maybe there's something to this. Because there's always something that you don't know. You know, Kat, just like the story I was telling about my wife, um, before then, if you'd have told me that you need to compound bioidentical hormones for her to be happy and healthy, I'd have said, nah, you know, we can, we got, we got Primarin, we got, we, we'll, she'll be great because I hadn't experienced it. And, and it's just human nature. And, uh, and so we're trying to get the word out right now. And, and again, the word has gotten out. I mean, here we have 8 million Americans using hormones that are compounded, natural hormones. So apparently a lot of people have gotten the word, but I, I can say that the FDA is also not on board with us compounding hormones. The FDA, um, matter of fact, the outgoing director of the FDA, Scott Gottlieb, who is a, a doctor, medical doctor, he spoke at a conference I was attending in Houston uh, two years ago. And, and he said, you know, inside the FDA, we have an anti-compounding culture. And, uh, and we do not believe in what you do. And we are doing everything we can to get rid of you. <laughs> and so, I mean, we've intercepted emails. Said, oh, this legislation by Congress will put another nail in the coffin of compounders. You know, in other words, they're trying to wipe out an entire industry that is helping millions. And I'm talking not just hormonal patients. I'm talking about patients that I've reversed autoimmune diseases on and I'm doing thyroid for. And I'm helping children uh, with autism. I mean, I'm doing amazing work. I'm helping soldiers with traumatic brain injury, PTSD, recover and be reintegrated back into society. And compounding allows me to do all that stuff. So just think of the millions beyond just hormone patients that we're helping. And FDA is has it in their crawl that, that we're dangerous and that we need to be eliminated. Now, there have been bad compounders. I mean, you may have heard about that uh, compounding center in New England that, that killed some people. Um, and they were a bad actor and, uh, and they were doing horrible things. They were inspected by FDA three times. FDA failed to act. The State Board of Pharmacy in Massachusetts um, inspected them three times, failed to act, allowed this bad behavior to continue, and they killed some people. So I feel like the FDA is culpable there. The, the State Board of Pharmacy in Massachusetts was culpable for those deaths. But that's a bad actor. And just because there's a bad actor doesn't mean you need to wipe out an industry. Um, like I know bad doctors. I know bad CPAs. I know bad lawyers who are unethical. But you know what? They don't legislate them out of existence. They regulate the bad guys um, into line. And we're regulated. We're way regulated. I mean, if you knew how regulated we were, you would think that we're almost acting as manufacturers because we have so many regulations on how we need to do this, how safety protocols, you know, our patients are getting incredible products out of us. You know, an example, the, the, we weigh powders, let's say hormone powders. Okay. We weigh those on a scale that costs $5,000. It's an analytical electronic balance. 
um, that has printers attached to it that we can prove how much we weigh. And it's five thousand dollars. We have a twenty thousand dollar machine that just simply mixes the powders, you know, the inactive with the active, so that whenever we make a capsule, the actives are spread through the capsule evenly. Twenty thousand dollars. We're investing in technology. We have a twenty-five thousand dollar machine that mixes the creams. You know, when you get a hormone cream that mixes these creams. In other words, we care so much about our patients. It's not about our profits. It's about taking care of patients, getting positive patient outcomes. I totally know all about what you're speaking when it comes to overregulation, trying to get almost rid of an industry by causing so much. But that's where we're living right now. That's what we have to work with. So how could bias against compounding pharmacies limit the options available to doctors treating patients? That is, that is a real concern because as I said earlier, if um, I was, I was, I guess I should back up and say I was testifying at the study that FDA commissioned at the um, National Academy, Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. So I go into this group and, and here is this committee that, that the FDA has commissioned this study. They're supposed to commission the study and then step away. Well, no, they, and there's a law that actually says if the FDA commissions a study or any government entity commissions a study through the uh, NASA, National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, then that entity has to step away and allow the science to happen, allow all of the data to be gathered and then to come up with a conclusion. Okay. Well, FDA inserted themselves in the middle of that entire process, which is illegal, there's a federal law that says they can't do it. They uh, had influence on who was going to sit on the committee, the committee members. They also had lots of influence on who was going to be expert speakers in order to influence the committee. And then after the study was completed, then the committee had to come up with recommendations and conclusions based on the data. And that committee allowed FDA people and ex-FDA people who are anti-compounding to influence their conclusions. In other words, the conclusions had nothing to do with the testimony that they heard. They already had a predestined conclusion from the FDA and all they did is just, they spent $2 million of taxpayer money to get a conclusion that was nothing but just an opinion piece. You know, I presented for three hours to this committee, giving them all kinds of science and patient outcomes, positive patient outcomes. And instead, they did, and I gave them studies, you know, lots of studies that had been done on the biological hormones, proving that they're effective and they're safe. They decided to not allow any of the studies that I uh, recommended that they use. They wouldn't allow any of the testimony that we gave. And I was not the only expert. There were lots of experts that, that were very scientific in their um, uh, delivery. And, and they instead and ignored all of that and came up with the conclusion that FDA told them to come up with. And so, therefore, FDA is trying to, and, and they're, they're probably going to, try to make some kind of, of statement coming up. And I hope the women and men who are listening understand that your ability to choose compounded biological hormones, which should be your choice, could be taken away if FDA tries to legis or, or tries to regulate us completely out of existence. And that's a cry and shame because our outcomes are better than pharmaceutical outcomes. We know that we probably get as much as a 20% reduced risk over some of the pharmaceuticals. Just like blood clots in the legs, DVTs, we have a 260% decreased risk of blood clots if you're using transdermal estrogen, oral progesterone, and uh, transdermal testosterone than if you are um, using Primpro, which is oral Primarin and oral progesterone acetate, which is chemicalized. So women need to understand that, that they have, they don't have zero risk, but they have the lowest risk if they use the compounded biological hormones. And, and that is my opinion, but it, it is an opinion backed up by a lot of science. They still prescribe a hormonal birth control, which has way more risks. So mm -hmm. it's just they are picking and choosing what they'll allow. You know, Kat, that's a, that's a funny statement you just made. I have a lot of women who get to menopause. They say, oh, I'm not using any of those hormones. I would, those are too dangerous. But their whole life, they took birth control pills, which increased their breast cancer risk by 20%. They increased their clotting by 30 or 40%, you know, blood clots and DVTs. And I'm just thinking... 
all I want is I want patients to make educated and informed decisions. I want them to have the right information and then use that information to make a, an educated and informed decision about their own health because I can't tell them what to do. I have a, a strong opinion. And if they ask me, I'll tell them <laughs> that, that sounds like a little therapy. Doesn't it? I have a strong opinion about that. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> But uh, but I, I, I let my women know that if you want to hear my opinion, I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to give you the science that backs that up. And then I'll let you make a decision on whether or not you decide to use hormones. And uh, and so just like an example, 80 percent of breast cancer risks, 80 uh, percent of breast cancer cases are in women who have never taken a hormone. That is shocking to me. Women who have had breast cancer and go back on hormones have a reduced risk of recurrence than women who do not have a reduced risk. Now, well, you'd have thought that'd be the highest risk, wouldn't you? And that was released at, at the big cancer symposium in San Antonio just last year. Matter of fact, University of Arizona released a study just a few weeks ago that says that, and I'm, I'm more scared of dementia than anything, so I'm bringing this dementia thing up. Women who use hormones, women who use bioidentical hormones, I should say, have a 78% decreased risk of developing dementia as they age. Now, 78% decreased risk is amazing. I mean, that, that's amazing. And women who are using the pharmaceutical hormones have about a 50% decreased risk. But bioidentical hormone uh, gals, 78%. And um, almost all entities now recognize that a woman should be on hormones for as long as she wants to have to feel good. In other words, there is no, oh, you, you're 55, you need to go off hormones. That has totally been thrown out by the North American Menopause Society, the Endocrine Society, and all other um, traditional and natural medicine societies have all thrown out the idea that, that women should not be on hormones more than five years. In other words, you stay on them as long as you want to feel good. When you want to start aging faster, get off your hormones. Do you want to age fast, faster, cat? No. <laughs> I don't want to age faster either. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm 65 and and uh, and I you know, and I'm not afraid of getting old, but I don't want to hurry it along. I, I want to continue to be as optimal as I can be. And, and at my age, I can tell you by doing the right things, which I've known how to do the right things for a lot of years, um, I am aging more slowly than my buddies. And as I'm not bragging, I'm, it, it's just a matter of science that I have better cholesterol, I have better triglycerides, I have better weight control, I don't ache, I don't have any aches and pains. My brain is clear. I'm living pretty optimally other than stress. I tend to put a little bit of stress on myself, so I, I could do better there. So tell us about the economic impact that the FDA overreach could have on pharmacists across the country. When you think about 7,000 compounding pharmacies in America, and almost all of those 7,000 pharmacies are doing hormones, compounded hormones for their patients. Now, if you take that away, that means you're taking away a big chunk of their livelihood. Um, yes, of course, the most important thing is what they're doing for patients, which is helping patients achieve better health and better quality of life. That's the most important thing. But economically, those pharmacies, the majority of them are going to close down. I mean, we're talking death of an industry. And let, not, not just those pharmacies are affected. Let's think about the far-reaching consequences of all the suppliers that supply those pharmacies. Because we have we have 20 suppliers that supply us with the little um, bottles that we put the cream in, and and the chemical suppliers where we buy those when they buy the, the chemicals from FDA inspected facilities. And what about all of the shipping? We're shipping these to patients, and so shippers are going to take a hit. So. It, all the way across the economy, there is going to be a huge hit. What about all the employees? I've got 32 employees here, and they make more money than their cohorts who are working for the chain drugstores, okay? They're making good money. My pharmacists, I have seven pharmacists on staff, you know, including me, eight pharmacists, actually. And I don't need that many pharmacists. I'm way overemployed, but I like to take care of patients, okay? So that means eight pharmacists are going to be out on the street. How can you justify uh, economically killing an industry just because of a prejudice that has no science backing behind it. It's just a prejudice by the FDA. So you're saying they're going after compounding in general? Yes. Mm -hmm. They want to they want to eliminate all compounding, but they know that if they eliminate hormone compounding that the majority of us will go under. And there there's and, and we've actually in the intercepted emails that say that was their strategy. 
Okay. So it's not like we're just making this up. You know, it's, well, this is probably what they're thinking. No, they've told us because Freedom of Information Act, we, we are allowed to get their emails, their internal emails. They're sending among each other. And it is very damning, excuse my language, very damning to hear what they're saying about us. And especially based on the fact that we are doing so much good for so many people. Yeah, we had a friend that was a compounding pharmacist. He had his own little pharmacy here in Miami somewhere, and he had his patients and that would come in. It was a great little business. It completely supported himself more than he would make if he worked for a CVS or whatever. And then he started getting kind of like mafia type shakedowns, like, oh, come work for us. We'll pay you this amount. Shut down. And mm -hmm. he didn't do it. And then the city went after him. It was a big mess. So have you noticed maybe any of your peers experiencing similar issues when it comes to the bigger pharmacies? Yeah, I actually have been offered for the purchase of my pharmacy from one of those entities. And then a few years ago, I should back up. Pharmacists have always been involved in pain management. Okay. And pain management is something that we can help with. Like my wife had a knee replacement surgery here. I'm, poor, poor my wife. <laughs> the reason I'm really good at integrative medicine is because everything that can happen to a human being has happened to my wife. And she doesn't mind me talking about it, by the way. So she gave me permission. Yeah. And so she had knee replacement surgery a year and a half ago and she can't take opioids. You know, she has an intolerance to opioids. It is. And so she was hurting. I mean, knee surgery, it's a complete uh, knee replacement. So I did pain creams. Uh, for her knee and the nerve pathways and was able to keep her out of pain um, without having to take pain pills, okay, without having to take opioids. That pain medicine is valid. It's ethical um, that we were using these transdermal um, pain creams that we can use to block nerve pathways. But there were some business guys, not pharmacists, but business guys who saw an opportunity. So they started overbilling because there was a, a a billing um, capability in those days that allowed them to jack the prices up for maybe a $300 compound. They were charging $15,000 for it because of this formula that had been allowed. And so they started actually inventing patients. They were bringing patients in that didn't even hurt, giving them prescriptions. And, and bottom line is there was abuse among this small number of we call them pain cream pharmacies. And so they were making millions and millions of dollars a day, a day. There were some here in, uh, in my area and the two owners, two business guys were both buying custom golf strings for themselves. Okay. So unfortunately, ethics, bad ethics are in every profession. You hear about doctors who are billing Medicare for procedures they didn't do. And you hear about lawyers who are in and on schemes. When you hear investment counselors who are in on Ponzi schemes. So there's bad guys in every profession. And these were bad guys. And But they were trying to buy up all the pharmacies at the time because they wanted to eliminate all the pharmacies except theirs because they thought this was going to go on forever. A lot of those guys are now in jail because there was a lots of fraud involved. And they needed to be in jail. And the doctors who were supplying them need to be in jail, too. I had a doctor come to me and said, Jim, I write 40 pain cream prescriptions a day. And I want you to do all my pain creams. I hear you're the best compounder in North Texas. And I want you to do all my pain creams for me. I said, well, I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, 12000 to $15,000 times 40. How many millions is that? I can't even add that high, to be honest with you. And, and he said, but what are you going to do for me? And I said, well, doc, I'm going to make the best cream gin possible. I'm going to use the best chemicals. I'm going to use the best base. I'm going to tell the patients how to use it. Uh, and they go, Jim, 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 what are you going to pay me? He said, give me 60% of every prescription and I'll send them all to you. And you know what? There's bad guys in the physicians and the pharmacists and the lawyers and the, and the, the, the CPAs. And so those guys exist. And so I, and I, I'm feel, I feel sad about it. And uh, the organization I belong to of company pharmacies, we actually were horrified by that practice. And because we're all good guys, most of us are really good guys. We're ethical. Money is not our motivator. Our motivator is helping patients. You know, we're caretaking people. You know what a caretaker is. So we developed a code of ethics. And, and so we make everybody in our organization if you want to be a member of our organization, then you have to subscribe to that code of ethics. And we actually came up with the code of ethics and we subscribe to it. And, uh, and it, 
I can't say anything other than it makes me feel good. I can sleep at night. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. I mean, that happens in every industry, not just in the medical field. I remember working for a clinic and there was Medicaid fraud. I remember physicians working with pharmaceutical companies. Oh, if, if you hit this many, we'll send you to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just how it works, unfortunately. <laughs> By the way, my wife would love your backdrop, you know. <laughs> she, she's a blinger. And, and so she would be so crazy if she got – I can't wait for her to see the podcast because she's going <laughs> to love your backdrop. It's, she's, a, she's a very art artsy, you know. Yes, I'm very childlike, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's working for you. <laughs> All right. So in your opinion, why do you feel hormonal imbalances are so common? Because I think that they're, they seem to be worse than like our great grandmothers had for women, especially going through menopause. You know, I'm not sure that they're worse now than they were then. Um, and and there, there's reasons why they could be worse. And I'll get to that. But in those days, women were very stoic. You know, when they went through menopause, a lot of them went a little crazy, you know, because I don't know you. Just like I saw my wife, all the emotional and physiologic disturbances in her when she had the, the hysterectomy, the oophorectomy. Um, and so it, it is real. I mean, you know, you feel depressed. You feel anxious. You know, you, your brain goes foggy. You know, you don't feel like yourself. And so it's, it, it's understandable that in those days they would put you in an insane asylum if you started exhibiting symptoms of being touched. That's what they call it. Oh, she's touched, you know by the whatever the evil spirits or whoever and and so they would put them they would lock them away and so women were stoic they didn't talk about how bad they felt now women are more open about talking about it okay here's how i feel fix me <laughs> and uh, and so it's okay to talk about it now and but but there are still women who are still reluctant to talk about it they just go you know what my grandmother made it through it i can make it through it but you know you're not going to make it through life with the quality of life that you can if you use these hormones. So, so you, yes, you should use them. Yes, you should have better quality of life. And there's so many impediments to, to uh, over the last few years for, for women to even use hormones that I've, I've felt bad for them. A, a Yale study showed that there was hundreds of thousands of needless deaths, early deaths, in women who were too afraid to take their hormones because of hormone hysteria from that 2002 Women's Health Initiative study, which turns out was completely bogus. The entire study has been thrown out now. And, and it was thrown out by the original researchers. They said, you know what, we got it wrong. After following these women, we're seeing women are having reduced risk of breast cancer, reduced risk of heart disease, reduced risk of dementia, reduced risk of osteoporosis. I mean, reduced risk of colon cancer. And they, it took them a few years to admit that they were wrong, but they admitted it. Because it was a very biased study, you know, it, which means that it wasn't good science, you know. So I, I'm glad that they came through. But isn't it interesting, Kat, that you never hear good news? You only hear the bad news. Oh, women, if you're using hormones, you have a 27% increased risk of invasive breast cancer. But then when they come out and go, oh, you know what? We found out it's not a 27% increased risk. It's a 20% it's a reduced risk of breast cancer. You don't hear that on the news, do you? You know, it's good news. Good news is not sensational. Bad news is sensational. You know, so it seems like our news people sometimes do us a disservice. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why views have gone down so much. But, but I can, uh, I, I, I evade your question a little bit, but I can say that in this day and time, you know, we are stressed out, you know, and when you're stressed, unfortunately, that causes a dysfunction in the brain and in hormones downstream because the brain has an area called the hypothalamus and uh, and i'm not going to test you on this later so don't don't worry but the hypothalamus is an area that senses hormone levels senses thyroid levels senses um cortisol levels and and, and it then it then sends signals you know through the pituitary um through signaling hormones down to the ovaries and says, Hey ovaries, I want you to produce more estrogen or, or less estrogen or, or, or men, I want your testes to produce more testosterone or adrenals. I want you to produce more cortisol, you know, or less cortisol. So there's communication going on from the brain, the control center down to all these glands. And uh, when we're under stress, then that, that drives cortisol higher and higher and higher. And unfortunately, our bodies were not made to fight the saber-toothed tiger 24 hours, seven days a week. 
we're supposed to go fight the saber tooth tiger, then go back to the cave and rest a little bit with Cave Woman, you know, and then uh, have a little fun with Cave Boy, and then go back out and, and fight the woolly mammoth, and then go back to the cave. And we're supposed to have levels of stress followed by uh, relaxation. We don't do that. We put so much pressure on ourselves, and especially as type AAA personalities, <laughs> um, that, that unfortunately we drive our cortisol higher and higher and higher. And unfortunately that means that the brain gets shut down. The brain says, Oh, we got toxic levels of cortisol. I am going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to block all signaling on cortisol. So next time you know, the adrenals aren't putting out any cortisol or any DHEA or adrenaline and you feeling tired and depressed and anxious and, and you're wondering what's wrong with me. And the bottom line is that the brain has just said, you're in timeout. It's not that the adrenals are tired or fatigued. It's that the brain is dysregulated. It is dysregulating the adrenals because they are not being told what to do anymore. The communication has broken down. So, and that's true of the ovaries. And so we unfortunately see stress causing a reduction in hormones. A, a prime example, buddy of mine was a vice president for American Airlines, very stressful position. So at 59, his testosterone was 400. He retired a year later, and uh, and within six months, his testosterone jumped from 400 to 1100. And the only thing he did was retire. Yeah, you know, he didn't start using testosterone. Stress played that big a role. It it reduced his testosterone by two and a half times. So what is, that tells you that if it's happening on men, it's happening on women as well. And then what else have we got? We've got toxins. Toxins, we've got phytoestrogen. You know, we're drinking out of plastic bottles, which gives us estrogen feedback to the brain. The brain says, oh, I got excess estrogens. And, and here we are drinking out of plastic bottles and getting phytoestrogens and, uh, or plasticizers, which have estrogens in them. And so we're getting all of this mixed data coming into the brain. No wonder it's confused. So does that help? <laughs> Stress and toxins probably are the two biggie. Yeah, I would say so. Could you tell us a little bit about the importance of custom tailoring hormone treatments instead of the one size fits all approach? And I wanted to ask about what you think about those wild yam progesterone creams that everybody's using now. I'm worried about that. Yeah, I am too. Matter of fact, I'm even seeing estrogen creams being sold out of prescription. And you know what? And the North the NASM, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. One of their recommendations was that women who are choosing bioidentical hormones are not smart enough to make their own decisions about their health care. Now, that offends me because most of the women that I deal with are pretty darn smart. They're savvy. They've done research. They know what they're doing. And they also said doctors who are choosing to prescribe bioidentical hormones for their patients are not smart enough to make good decisions for their patients. Now, who do they think they are? We came to this dance with these hormones in our body, you know, by God or our higher power or nature, whatever you want to believe in. And you know what? The fact that they're here probably means that they were the best thing for us, you know, and for them to say anybody who chooses to use the same hormones that are in your body is stupid, offends me. And that was what these idiots um, who were supposed to be so smart concluded. And so that makes me mad. I'm, I'm red faced right now. I'm sorry. I'm blushing on. <laughs> you can tell I get a little angry about that. So there is a, when we use uh, bioidentical hormones that are compounded, we're allowed to adjust the doses based on each individual. And, and it takes feedback. It takes feedback from the patient to the prescriber to say, and or the pharmacist, you know, I'm always helping my guys to say, I'm having these symptoms. What do those symptoms mean? you got to be able to interpret those symptoms. I mean, I've done thousands and thousands of patients, so I know what to expect. I teach it. I do labs and doctors do labs. So we can look at the labs and we can go, hmm, the labs show that you should be having hot flashes, are you? Nope, not having any hot flashes. Well, then I'm not going to adjust your dosage up if you're not having hot flashes because you're feeling good. So there's an art to this, and that art cannot normally be achieved by a woman just buying some over-the-counter progesterone, which who knows what's in it. You know, I mean, it's not regulated by FDA and they buy some estrogen cream over the counter and who knows what's in that or the yam creams, which are supposed to be converted to progesterone. Well, but her body's not converting enough progesterone already. Why would putting some precursor yam 
uh, sterols in your body make you make more. It won't. Okay. I mean, the ovaries are either going to make it or they're not. And by putting that on the skin is not going to make them make more progesterone. Um, so I, I have a problem with that. What I need is I need to work in a triad with the patient and the physician and the pharmacist um, to make the best decisions for the patient. It, the patient has to give really good feedback and the more they're educated, the better feedback they give me. And, and so we work as a team as opposed to it's all in the patient to do it themselves with something that is going to work. Or the doctor is looking at labs, not even talking to the patient and making decisions, which doesn't work either. We've got to have that triad going, you know, patient, doctor, and pharmacist in order to get the best outcomes for these patients. So a lot of the women who listen to this podcast, they have PCOS, endometriosis, thyroid problems, other hormonal imbalances. So when you have excess hormones like estrogen dominance, really high testosterone, can hormone replacement therapy help in those cases? Um, absolutely. Um, you're, I know that you're pretty savvy on this topic. On, let's start with PCOS, okay? Uh, pretty savvy on this topic for premenopausal women. Um, and when we do labs on, let, I usually try to do them on day 19 of your cycle. If day, not, if day one of your cycle is the first, first day of your period, I usually on, look at day 19 because day 19 is the highest level of progesterone for the month. Also, your estrogen is the second highest of the month, so it gives me a good snapshot. Because I can't do labs every day on you, just look at your whole cycle. I would like to, but who's going to do that? So I do a snapshot of one representative time of the month that tells me what's going on. And we, in addition to getting estrogen level, estradiol levels, and progesterone levels, and testosterone, by the way, we also get levels of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And ladies, if your luteinizing hormone at that time of the month is double or triple the follicle stimulating hormone FSH, that means that you probably have PCOS. Okay. Now there's two types of PCOS that I encounter. There's typical and there's atypical. Um, typical PCOS. Oh, I get so far ahead of myself. Sorry, my ADD brain. And so here you've identified as having a high luteinizing hormone. And what that translates in for the lay person is that, that my brain, is asking for my ovaries to make more progesterone from the corpus luteum, which is the egg sac that's, that, that bursts. But the corpus luteum in the ovary is not producing that progesterone. So these women are all progesterone deficient. And uh, that means they're going to have unsteady periods. They're going to have, unfortunately, a lot of other side effects associated with this hormonal imbalance because they don't have enough progesterone on board to balance their estrogen. What we try to do is we try to, to, number one, in the typical case, we'll talk about the atypical next, okay? But in the typical PCOS case, then we've got to re replace that progesterone and get their hormones rebalanced. We also need to look at these gals because in the typical case, they also have insulin resistance. Insulin resistance um, is when you're eating a lot of carbs and the carbs drive insulin levels higher and higher and then the body sees so much toxic insulin that it quits using it okay to convert sugar to energy glucose to energy unfortunately that causes these pcos gals when they're younger they're thin because this extra insulin is eating up all their sugar so they're they're stick thin but then as they get older they start putting on weight and and unfortunately it continues because they become insulin resistant. So we need to do take measures to stop the insulin resistance, which means eating a, a controlled eating style. What I have the best luck with is if you want to label it, and I don't like to label diets or, or eating styles, but paleo eating style, which is really healthy, free range um, meats and cold water fish, you know, wild caught um, vegetables that are low glycemic index, no starchy vegetables, um, eliminating grains totally, 100%. And we find um, that, and, and also low glycemic index fruits, okay, stick berries, for instance, an example, good example. So, so when we eat this new eating style, all of a sudden insulin levels start coming down. Um, insulin receptor sites become more sensitive. We start seeing these women losing weight. And we also see a lowering of something called aldosterone. Because when women have high levels of blood sugar, um, blood glucose, it signals 
the body to increase levels of an enzyme that converts progesterone into aldosterone. And, and that enzyme starts working overtime. And what does aldosterone cause? It causes you to, to retain fluid, unfortunately. It causes you to have acne. Um, it causes hair loss, which, and it causes hair gain on a place you don't want it, like your arms. So you see a lot of PCOS gals have, have uh, dark hair on their arms, and they have acne, and they're gaining weight, and, and they're feeling PMSE, and, and usually they're depressed. Um, they usually have high cholesterol, high triglycerides, especially in the 30s and 40s. And so they, they've got a rough road to hoe unless they've got a, some kind of a therapist uh, or therapy that is helping them to control this insulin resistance. So that's typically what I see. I reverse PCOS all the time on patients. And, and also, by the way, endometriosis and other things are also, um, there's a study done, uh, and it's specifically on endometriosis, that showed a 75% reduction in the inflammatory aspects of endometriosis, which means how bad the case is, by simply going grain-free, eating paleo, eating style. In other words, it's so powerful because grains, for instance, are inflammatory to 100% of people who eat them, 100%. And they inflame the gut. They inflame the brain. Um, they are they are not your friend. They're also obviously going to cause you to gain weight because they are converted to um, sugar almost instantly. It's like eating a candy bar. We love breads. We love pasta. You know, we love all that stuff. Unfortunately, it's just not the best foods for us. You know. So anyway, women who have these gynecological problems are seeing incredible reductions in their symptoms by simply changing their diet. That's before we even start the hormone therapy. But let's just say we put the progesterone on board. Wow. Now we're going to start making some progress on these gals. We're going to really see um, them feeling better. They're going to feel them sleeping better, um, having better weight control. Uh, we're going to see them um, having less anxiety uh, and and better mood. You know, so I saw a lot of studies that when your estrogen levels decrease, your human growth hormone can also decrease. Mm -hmm. And if they fall around the same time, can you get hormone replacement therapy for human growth hormone, and is that a good idea? Your body is designed to work for a certain number of years, and then nature is designed you your hormones to decline. You go through menopause. You know, you go through perimenopause, and, and levels start uh, fluctuating wildly. Okay, matter of fact, almost as bad as in, in puberty. So from forty to fifty, there's this wild fluctuations in hormones as well, the, the typical woman as they decline. By by the time a woman is forty, she's lost eighty percent of her progesterone already. She's only lost twenty percent of her estrogen, but as it continues to decline, estrogen continues to decline. And so by 49 to 52, typically a woman has, has finally hit menopause, um, which is defined as they've quit having periods. Okay. And so the question is, what else is going on in the body? Well, hormones are not just sex hormones to help you with, have a good libido and have breasts and, and, uh, and have periods. You know, no, hormones are neuroactive steroids. I mean, they work in the brain. As I said earlier, 78% decreased risk of dementia if we continue to use the hormones. So these are neuroactive steroids. They're also anti-inflammatory steroids. So here we have inflammation in our body, which is the biggest enemy, and that's why we age, is we're in, inflamed and down-regulating. Um, so when we use the hormones, we're fighting that. We're fighting that down-regulation of nature. And we're not saying, hey, nature, I'm done. Take me. You know, as I say in West Texas, you know, nature wants to call you out of the herd when you go through menopause because all of a sudden women have a higher risk of heart disease than men. Within two years, they start having clots and higher risk of breast cancer and autoimmune diseases and dementia and osteoporosis. Number two killer women is osteoporosis. They start having all of these bad things happen because the hormones go away. And so we've got to fight this aging by using the hormones and maintaining balanced hormones premenopausal, perimenopausal, and postmenopausal. And in, in your uh, answer about growth hormone, I check growth hormone. And if you ever wanted to check yours, ladies and men, um, you should check IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. That is the active form and the stable form of growth hormone. You can test growth hormone in the blood. Unfortunately, growth hormone is very pulsatile. And so unfortunately, it's going up and down all day and, uh, and you can't get a good level. However, IGF-1 is a stable level and you can tell okay this is my my level of growth hormone and so what i look for is i look for people who are in the bottom one third 
of the normal range. If they're in the bottom one third of the normal range, then I know that if we give hormones, it's going to upregulate all of their systems in their body. Not just the sex hormones is going to up upregulate the thyroid system. It's going to upregulate the brain. It's going to upregulate the cardiovascular. It's going to upregulate the immune system. All of these systems are going to start upregulating, working like they were when you're younger. And, and growth hormone is just one of those systems, okay? So if I, if I see that the growth hormone doesn't rise enough, then we'll think about doing things to increase growth hormone. Like, for instance, you can do natural things. For instance, uh, fasting, intermittent fasting increases growth hormone. We know that for a fact. And especially if you do the fasting like early evening on through to the next morning, that's the best time because that, growth hormone is released at night. And so we want it to optimize at night. And if you're eating late, then that means you're producing insulin. And insulin is, is unfortunately competing with growth hormone at receptor sites. So, and, it, and it decreases the production of growth hormone. So what we want to do is we like to have that, that fasting um, in the evening so the growth hormone will be optimized. And also the effects of growth hormone will be optimized. Because growth hormone is at the anti-aging hormone. It's not a big growth hormone. Uh, it actually is a repair hormone. You know, so, so it is powerful. And uh, occasionally, though, we will give growth hormone to patients. Um, and man, you, when you have a person who's low on growth hormone and we start giving growth hormone, which is expensive, by the way, um, it is amazing because all of a sudden gray hair starts turning back to normal color. <laughs> Skin just starts looking 10 years younger. Um, uh, and, and, then, and then they feel amazing. And so it is powerful. I mean, I'm not sure it's for everybody, but it is powerful. There is another thing that we can use called sermorelin. Sermorelin is growth hormone releasing hormone. And I have a lot of doctors of my doctor prescribing sermorelin, which is much less expensive. And it causes the body to release more, more growth hormone. It doesn't actually give you growth hormone in itself. It just causes you to release more growth hormone. So sermorelin is that number. It's a little injectable and, and it, it, uh, it works nicely. Okay. So I wanted to talk about weight and hormones for a minute. So we know fertility levels are, there's, they say they're nearing extinction levels now. And I see a lot more women with hormonal imbalances when they're young, maybe because of the birth control. I don't know. And at the same time, everybody in the U.S. seems to be gaining more weight. And now other countries are all starting to gain more weight. So when it comes to weight and hormone levels, what do you think can be done for most people to lose weight and balance their hormones? Let's talk about premenopausal women and then menopausal women, okay? And then we'll talk about men. <laughs> Me being one. You know, even though I've, I've only had girls in my house, it seems like you know, <laughs> I still retain my man, man cards. <laughs> so, so premenopausal gals... If you are estrogen dominant, which you talked about, and estrogen dominant doesn't mean you have too much estrogen. It just means that you don't have enough progesterone and testosterone to balance you. Okay. And, and so they tend to put on weight in the hips. And so you're going to see um, the, uh, the lower body around the hips weight gain. And the body, what it's doing is it's creating fat to store excess toxic levels of estrogen. And, uh, and man, I have had patients who, who had all this excess estrogen dominance uh, weight, and they went on uh, maybe a, a really uh, heavy-duty, fast weight loss program, and they started releasing so much estrogen out of those fat tissues that they felt uh, morning sickness, like, like they were pregnant. So, so yes, estrogen body stores that excess estrogen in fat tissue. So it creates fat tissue. It stores it in there. But then we look at menopausal women. And menopause women who don't use hormones tend to be heavier than women who use hormones, okay? And that's been proven study after study that when your hormones are the highest, when you're 20s, you, have, you don't have weight problems or you have less weight problems. And if you have a healthy eating style, which unfortunately uh, America has the sad eating style, you know, the standard American diet, the sad. So unfortunately, we're, women are blaming their weight gain on hormones. The reality is it's study after study after study, as I said, show that women who are using hormones have a better time of controlling their weight. So that myth should be thrown out the door. Now, I can say that if a woman is only using estrogen as opposed to using a combination of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone in a balanced fashion, that they will probably tend to gain a little more weight. 
and because it causes an increase in a blood binding protein called sex hormone binding globulin. And as that sex hormone binding globulin goes up, it unfortunately ties up testosterone and estrogen, which then causes a lowering of your um, metabolism. And then, and again, when you use, when you have the estrogen alone, especially, or oral estrogens, if you're using oral estrogens, this sex hormone binding globulin goes up. And that sex hormone binding globulin also has a corresponding rise in thyroxin binding globulin, which is the globulin in the blood that grabs thyroid hormone and it prevents it from working. And so, yes, you're going to have a slower metabolism. So oral hormones tend to cause more of that sex hormone binding globulin rise than transdermal estrogen with, with oral progesterone and transdermal testosterone. So if you want to do optimal ladies, do transdermal estradiol and estriol, oral progesterone and transdermal um, testosterone. Those are going to be the women who have the best chance of maintaining their weight. Now, you know, okay, we could talk all day long about eating style because if you look at most people, I don't know how many people I have come in here. I do a lot of weight management on paid patients. And when the light goes on in their brain, when they finally figure out it's what this elbow action is, is what's causing them to gain weight. It's not hormones. It's not this. It's not that. It is, it is what they're eating and their choices. And when we change those choices and develop a new eating style, because I don't like to be calling it a diet, but a new eating style that minimizes insulin release and, uh, and maximizes cell restoration, all of a sudden, we have people who have their weight controlled. And, and I'm thinking about a few patients just in the back of my mind that, 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 that I saw the light, come on, light bulb come on in their brain because I talked to them two or three times. I just didn't get it. All of a sudden, when they got it, all of a sudden, weight just melted off of them. Now, in men, there's lots of misinformation about testosterone therapy. And me being 65 and living a stressful lifestyle running this operation, my testosterone level is not what it should be, so I do use testosterone. And, and men who use testosterone or who maintain solid testosterone levels have better weight control. Um, matter of fact, they have less chance of adult onset diabetes and by 20% lower risk. These hormones, we think of them again as being uh, like men. We think, oh, testosterone, that's for boom, boom in the bedroom. Well, no, it is for your brain and for your metabolism and, and for insulin glucose balance and heart health. It's for all these other things in the body that we don't think about, you know? So let's get into the specifics of how someone would take hormone replacement therapy from a compounding pharmacy. Your doctor is going to recommend this. Do you need a prescription? Do you go straight to the compounding pharmacy? How does that work? And then how are they administered? And can you, with the transdermal stuff, get that on your partner or your pets or anybody? <laughs> that made me laugh a little bit because uh, that happens a lot. So, but I'll get to that in a sec. Um, what I, what I can say is the steps are, um, is, is because patients need a path. They need a path to follow to get to a, a good practitioner. So oftentimes the compounding pharmacist knows the practitioners in the area that are doing a good job with hormones. Because when you go to your traditional doctor, unless they've been like some of my buddies who have seen our successes, they're not going to prescribe anything but traditional hormones. And, and the patients are not going to be as well controlled. So go to your compounding pharmacist and say, okay, who in this area does a good job with hormone balance? And, and it oftentimes, uh, my patients elect to have a consultation with me and they, we talk about it. I educate them about the risks and benefits because a lot of them are scared. I said, I don't want to have a heart disease and I don't want to have a stroke and I don't want to have breast cancer and I don't want to have dementia. But I heard that those hormones will cause all that, you know? And so they have this indwelling fear by, by the stupid lay media that is putting out misinformation. And so I'm, I'm really sad about that. And so anyway, I dispel those myths and, and we get their brain in the right place. We get their heart in the right place. We get them educated. I give them lots of, of uh, studies and data just so they can say, okay, if you ever want to go over this and read this, go ahead. If you want to go to sleep one night, just read these studies, <laughs> but they feel better. And then I say, okay. I'm, and it's like sending a, a in a restaurant to the right table and the right waiter. And so I sent them to a, a, a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a PA that suits them and what their expectations are of this therapy, you know? And so I don't just send them to just one practitioner. I have lots of practitioners in, the, in my area that I send these patients to based on their expectations of 
what they um, want in a, in a doctor and are in this relationship. Now, the prescriptions come back here to the company pharmacy, and, and we then look at those, evaluate them, go, okay, this looks right. Every now and then we see that docs who aren't maybe as experienced or maybe made a boo-boo and misprescribe. And so we correct that because we're the last bastion of hope there, right? Because we, we were teaching doctors how to do this. And so fortunately, we can help correct errors before they happen and mess a patient up. We get then compound them. And what I would suggest, again, I said it earlier, um, if you're going to use estrogen, I suggest using a combination of estradiol, which is the most powerful estrogen in the body, and estriol, which is the weakest estrogen, but it's also protective against breast cancer and it makes you feel better. You know, And so we use those two estrogens in a transdermal, on the skin, uh, fashion. Now, some women who don't want to get that on their babies or their grandbabies or their pets, we elect to use it in a place that maybe they won't be contacting those um, folks. And so we use a very tiny amount, and we're talking like um, the half of a size of a pencil eraser, labially, on the labia, because the labia are mucous membranes, which means they're, they're tissues that absorb hormones almost like a sponge. And so I have a lot of my ladies who use labial applied estrogen. Now, the same thing on testosterone, either topical or labial. And then uh, on the progesterone, studies show it's most protective if we take it orally. Um, a lot of women want to use it transdermally. And I'm saying, you know, I'll do that. But oral has a lot of benefits, less risk of breast cancer or, or better protection against breast cancer, I should say. And also the oral has a calming effect. And most of my ladies who are needing hormones are needing sleep. They're having anxiety, they're having uh, sleep issues, and oral progesterone is converted to a metabolite called allopregnenolone. I won't test you on that, but, but allopregnenolone is one of the metabolites of progesterone when you take it orally that helps hit GABA receptor sites, and GABA receptor sites make you feel calm and sleepy. And matter of fact, UT Southwestern Med School, University of Texas Med School here in Dallas, did a study on women with PMS. They found out that women with PMS had low allopregnenolone levels, which means they have low progesterone levels. And so we give progesterone that helps with uh, PMS. So, so those are the best ways for the women to use the hormones. And how about getting them on your pets? Okay. True story. I, and I, if I showed you my phone, you, you'd see my dog, Daisy. <laughs> and Daisy is, a, I don't know why, but I guess I'm maybe old and sentimental, but I just love that dog. You know, and so little Daisy, um, she we had her fixed, you know, and uh, and all of a sudden she starts her vulva starts swelling up. It looks like she's fixing to have a period, and uh, and we just and Jan wasn't paying attention, you know, my wife, and uh, and she unfortunately got some extra hormones on poor little Daisy's only twelve pounds, got some hormones on Daisy, and so Daisy started going, hey man, I got hormones, I'm gonna have a period, <laughs> you know. So anyway, we we started being more careful, and of course Daisy went back to normal in no time. But I have had um, patients and who ignored my warnings about this because I actually have a sheet where I get it to and say, here's where you can use your hormones and transference is a big issue. Careful, careful, careful. Had a grandmother who was uh, using um, her hormones faithfully and taking care of her grandbaby and the baby started getting precocious puberty uh, and went to children's and, and uh, children's calls me up and said, Jim, is uh, this grandmother on topical hormones? Yeah, or No, this baby has precocious puberty. I said, I said, what is the, the family name? And I said, oh, yep, I know exactly who that is. And uh, and she's using transdermal hormones. So we switched her uh, to the labial. And she was, and the daughter forgave the, the grandmother, the mother. And so she was able to continue to love on her little grandbaby. But I get calls from, from Children's Hospital, both in Dallas and in Fort Worth, about questions about transdermal hormones, because they know that I'm one of the experts on that. Yeah. So yes, it is a big deal. Does it have like a time limit where it will fully absorb and then you can touch the area, other people can touch it and it's fine? How long yeah. is that usually? What, one of my patients, you know, she and her husband had only been married five or six years, even though they were in their, you know, late 50s, you know. And, uh, and so she, she said, Jim, I'm going to give you too much information, but, but man, when my husband puts on his testosterone cream on his chest, I don't know why, but I just have this urge just 
we come out of the shower and I just want to press all over him, you know, and, and I tested her testosterone levels and she had an 800. She's supposed to have a 50 or 60. She had an 800. So she is absorbing his testosterone. I said, we got to convert him to testosterone shots because you're absorbing. I'm not going to tell you to quit doing what you're doing because I love y'all being married and happy and all that kind of stuff and having good relations, but I got to get, get him off the topical testosterone. And, and, you know, I feel honest with you, I don't normally have that problem, but I do have instances where it's a big deal. And so we just, we just pivot to a therapy that's going to take care of that. But uh, yes, uh, poor little Daisy was a victim of uh, topical hormones and from an expert, from experts. So it could happen to anybody, you know. Are there any risk to bioidentical hormone placement therapy or it's better than not taking hormones at all? Let's just think about what are the percentages of risks out there in the studies? Because there's been studies on this since the 80s, okay? Um, and 90% of the studies agree. And when you have 90% of studies, we call that a preponderance of evidence, which means that the studies all agree to the same conclusion. And the conclusions are is that women who are using hormones have a 50% decreased risk of risk of, of excuse me of heart disease they have a significantly decreased risk of osteoporosis which as i said earlier is a number two killer of women they have a decreased risk of dementia they had 78 percent according to that study recently they have a, a decreased risk of breast cancer by as much as and maybe even more 20 percent over women who are using nothing okay so what we do is we compare the risk compared to women who are not using any hormones and so in my opinion, that's the best measure that I can give is if you use hormones, you get reduction over if you're deciding to do what your grandmother did, which is use no hormones. And so I'm a big fan of using them to reduce risk. Now, I tell my women over and over and men too, over and over and over, because you're using hormones doesn't mean that you can't have any risk, but you have a reduced risk. Let's talk about breast cancer. 12% um, of women are going to get breast cancer, period. Now, as I said earlier, 80% of women who get breast cancer never took a hormone. So what does that mean? That means that hormones are not the causative factor on breast cancer. However, if a woman gets breast cancer, she wants to blame it on something. She don't want to blame it on the fact that she's been eaten at McDonald's every single day. Excuse me, McDonald's. I have a friend who owns several of them. <laughs> um, um, she don't want to blame it on the fact that she uh, doesn't exercise. She doesn't want to blame it on the fact that she doesn't have take the proper supplements to break down estrogens. She wants to blame it on something. And it's just human nature. I mean, every one of us wants to. And so I'm not blaming the ladies for wanting to blame somebody. But the reality is you got to look inward and you got to say, okay, what did I do to cause this? What can I do better going forward? And so when we look at these risks, we've got to think, what's the best way for me to have the lowest risk possible? We can't eliminate risk, but what's the best way for me to have the lowest risk possible? And that is to use the hormones in a balanced fashion. And it has to be balanced. So what would happen to people who are dependent on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy if they suddenly got rid of compounding pharmacies? I would be really sad for those 8 million patients. And that number is climbing every day because both men and women are not stupid. As, as North America, as, as the, excuse me, as the NASM said in their conclusion on that study, women and men are not stupid. They are pretty smart. They're pretty savvy. They know what works for them. And these are working for them. And wouldn't it be sad if all of a sudden there was no access for these patients to have these hormones? And, uh, and I, in 2007, the FDA got a complaint from a drug manufacturer, okay, Big Pharma, that that estriol, which is one of the natural estrogens that we use in our formula, uh, represents a health risk to the women of America. Now, it's so funny. That was why the pharmaceuticals that lodged that complaint uh, to the FDA. And the FDA then banned estriol. Now, if you look at why the pharmaceuticals, they had two patented medications, hormone medications in Europe that had estriol in it. So apparently, European women and American women are completely different. That's, that's a joke. It's, I mean, facetious. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, all this was was about a drug company trying to get us to quit compounding hormones with estriol because it was one of our advantages. And so they were trying to gain a competitive advantage by having FDA ban estriol. Well, what did women in America do? They rose up this, this tidal wave and uh, they started calling 
the FDA. They started calling congressmen. And the congressmen finally got so upset, they said, FDA, stop it. And the FDA backed off and said, okay, Estriel is okay. <laughs> but, but in other words, your voice matters. And, uh, and I want to make sure that you understand that because right now, um, FDA is attempting to put together a case to ban hormones from women. And the only way that I can say that you can influence that is to go to compounding.com. So www.compounding.com. I want you to put in a testimonial about how compounded hormones have helped you. And, uh, and these testimonials are going to be fed to Congress. We have thousands of them right now, but every congressman needs to see his constituents um, in his area uh, writing testimonials. And once those, all these testimonials get into the website, then we have a national campaign going on right now where we're trying to expose congressmen and women, congresswomen, <laughs> and the lawmakers, in addition, doctors and patients, to the benefits of the compounded hormones. And so your voice matters. Your voice makes a difference. And you may think I'm just one person, but just think of all those one people who, in 2007, overturned a horrible bad decision by the FDA and were and we were continued to allow to compound with estriol which is life saving for a lot of women. So should we also send emails letters petition to anyone else? Our local yeah, congressman? On, on the on that website you will not only see the ability to write your testimonial and it'll go into the database, which means that the congressman will say, hey we've got we've got fifty two women in your area who have already written testimonials, you know, which means a lot to them, by the way, whenever they see these things. And in addition, you can write your, an email and it has, it has a way to contact your congressman on that website. And you can write an email directly to your congressman and say, Hey, buddy, <laughs> or, or gal, <laughs> my congressman is a woman. Matter of fact, I helped her get elected and uh, she's a darling, you know, and, uh, and make sure that your voice is heard directly to Congress or through the website I just told you about. And if you want to, if you want to get on to the email list, I mean, they got you an email list so we can keep you updated because FDA hasn't made the action official yet. But when they do, we want to alert everybody so that we can make sure and rise up just like last time and, and defeat this kind of thing, because we have to keep these for patients, the access for patients. So where can everyone find you online and which social media platforms are you the most active on? You know, I'm on Facebook, <laughs> uh, uh, Facebook, um, you know, uh, and uh, Jim Hernser, and I, I have posts a couple of times a, a week, you know, that I do. I try not to overpost. I'm not an overposter. I'm not going to let you know when I'm going to the bathroom or, or <laughs> and I, I, I get on a rant every now and then and write something. I wrote about supplements, uh, which supplements are helpful for COVID, for instance, I and mean, it was one of the most watched. I, I did a, a, a online seminar on weight loss and 5,000 people tuned into it. You know, I do hormone seminars um, on that as well, but mostly I just do little tidbits and just to let you know of what's going on and what my belief system is and what the science says. And so Facebook with Jim Hernser and then Las Plains Pharmacy links to Jim Hernser. So you can get it on that as well. Yeah. <clears throat> and well, I'm really doing this podcast to really help my business personally. I'm really doing this podcast to get awareness of the public about what's going on out there. Now, when people do send me a question, I answer it. Okay. And, uh, and so they go on my website on lascolinaspharmacy.com. That's L-A-S instead of L-O-S, but lascolinaspharmacy.com. And when they put a question on the website, I answer it. And I answer it, you know, uh, pretty quickly because I don't know. I feel like everybody needs information and they need the right information. And so I just, I don't know why I feel like I need to save the world, but I really do care um, about everybody and they don't have to be my patients for me to care about them. Well, thank you so much for your hard work and everything you're doing to keep bioidentical hormone replacement therapy an option for everyone. Well, Kat, I can't thank you enough for doing the work you're doing because you're bringing awareness to this as well. And, uh, and so you're a hero in my eyes and, uh, and also a hero in bringing um, health ideas to people who, who are being bombarded by, by traditional ideas that aren't working. So thank you for what you're doing too. Well, thank you so much for your time.